Well, hey there, Heritage. I want to welcome all of you across the network, our families at Bettendorf, the Medikiwani, those online, each of you here at Rock Island, welcoming you to week three of Not So Average Joes. A conversation that's just simply anchored in the reality that God seeks to work all things for the good of those who love him. We know that from Romans 8, 28. We're going to get to that scripture again a little bit later. But when we kicked off this conversation two weeks ago, I introduced you to a French acrobat that was known by the name of the great Blondin. And the great Blondin rose to fame and made a name for himself by crossing Niagara Falls on a tightrope. And he did it more than 300 times in his career, and he kept doing it in more outrageous ways. He did it blindfolded on stilts, and one of the tricks that he had is that he would walk across, no safety net or harness in any of this, with a wheelbarrow, blindfolded, he'd get the crowd all pumped up, and then he'd say, who wants to hop into the wheelbarrow and go with me? And people wouldn't go. Because it's one thing to say we trust, it's another thing to demonstrate that trust. And it's even yet another thing to demonstrate that trust in certain circumstances. Maybe you could think about it this way. This right here is just a, a regular two by four, nothing special, nothing fancy about it, just a regular two by four. But if I were to take this two by four and set it back on the ground and say, hey, listen, I am going to walk across this two by four, be impressed, you would be like, great, go for it. And I would be able to do it. I'd get on it, I'd walk across, and you'd go, wonderful, Sean, great, good job. Thank you. Then, then the reality is, but if I take that two by four and then I lift it and put it maybe, oh, say, 100 feet in the air, Still feel the same? Feels a little bit different, doesn't it? But it's the same task. Even if we kind of put it down here just a few feet off the ground and I say, I'm going to go grab a chair and I'm going to walk across this two by four. You say, like, oh, hold on, wait, wait, wait. I have concern for you. you like, I have concern for me as well. Because even though it's the same task as on the floor, it's really not the same circumstance. What makes it different is the circumstances. The, the circumstances kind of kind of cause a different feeling. It can create a different dynamic around the same task. It can change because of the risks involved, the distractions related to it. It is not the same walking across this two by four, 100 feet in the air, let alone a few feet, as it is if it's simply on the ground. And that makes sense to us. But hear me, when it, when it comes to a two by four or a wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls, that, we're tracking that reality. But when it comes to faith, when it comes to things of God, faith is based in trust, not circumstances. Faith is based in trust, not circumstances. See, as a people who are readily influenced by what we experience, who, who can actually be tempted to allow circumstances to define more than they should, including our relationship with God, where we can run to God and run from God based on what's good or bad, what we feel or not feel. The reality is our relationship with God should rise above circumstances. For all intents and purposes, circumstances should be irrelevant. They just simply don't matter in a relationship of trust. So we've been having a conversation in this series where we're looking at the lives of a few Joes in Scripture uh, to help us navigate life. We're calling them not-so-average Joes. One, because they were named Joe, or something close to that. But also because they weren't average. And we don't have to be either. We can live lives in the exceptional if we're willing to embrace not-so-average faith. Rooted in trust, not circumstance. We started this conversation looking at Joseph in the Old Testament. Last week we looked at Jonah, and this week we're looking at Job. And Job will help us understand that genuine, enduring faith is based in trust, not circumstance. Now I want to be clear, I want to acknowledge that circumstances are real. But anyone and everyone who follows Jesus is called to live in circumstances differently. Our relationship with Jesus positions us to rise above the junk of life, the stuff of life. In fact, let's just do this. And I want to invite our Bettendorf families and Kwani men to get in on this as well. I'm, I'm going to identify a few things. And if it connects to you in your life, I want you to raise your hand and keep your hand raised. So again, if this, any of this or all of it connects with you, just raise your hand and keep it raised. Here's the, here's the first one. If you have ever experienced the loss of a loved one, raise your hand. Keep it up. Raise it up and keep it up. If you've ever experienced health issues, illness or pain, raise your hand and keep it up. If you've ever experienced loss of property or belongings or status or a job, raise your hand and keep it up. If you've ever experienced criticism from friends 
or even false accusations from them. Raise your hand and keep it up. If you've ever been ridiculed and abandoned by those same friends or family, raise your hand. Okay, thanks. You can put your hands down. I think most, if not all of us, can connect to one or even all of those things. And if your life journey can connect to some or all of those, listen, welcome to the life of Job. Job experienced all of those things in a very short period of time. He experienced more than his fair share of challenging circumstances. He lost his wealth and landed in poverty. He lost, his kids were taken from him when they died. He, he would lose his health. His health would be taken from him. His wife would lose confidence in him. His friends would walk away from him. And the friends who stayed with him would condemn him and accuse him. In those brutal circumstances, this not-so-average Joe lived a not-so-average life, navigating all of that by choosing to trust. In fact, in Job 13, he, he says this. He says, even if he killed me, I'd keep on hoping. He, he's talking about God. Even if God killed me, I'd keep on hoping. He's saying this to his friends who remained but yet accused him. He's saying, I, even if that happened, I'd keep on trusting. I'd keep on hoping. Circumstances don't matter. Whatever happens to me is irrelevant. I will keep trusting. I will keep hoping. Another translation has him declaring, I have no other hope. Not out of a lack of of spaces to put hope, but out of a commitment to place his hope in the one who created him and to live a faith based in trust and not circumstances. How do we do that? How does that happen? How is it even possible to experience all that he experienced yet to hold fast in trust? Again, a genuine enduring faith is based in trust, not circumstances. Circumstances for all intents and purposes are irrelevant. So what I actually want to do today is invite all of us to take a step back and to consider the status and nature of our relationship, our individual relationships with God. Are they deeply rooted enough, developed enough that circumstances don't matter? That whatever we experience is ultimately irrelevant? That we can have a not-so-average, genuine, enduring faith based in trust, not circumstances? I want us to know how to live that way. I want to live that way. And so we're going to look at the life of Job. And if you have a Bible, I invite you to grab it and turn to the book of Job, chapter 1. And in most Bibles, when you open up the Bible right in the middle, you hit in Psalms or close to Psalms. And Job precedes Psalms. So if you find Psalms, work your way back until you hit Job. And Job is actually considered to be one of the books of poetry, along with Psalms and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. It follows right on the heels of 17 books of history in the Old Testament. And it is considered to be the oldest book of poetry, which is really quite fitting because it pokes at and leans into and, and presses into one of the oldest questions of humanity, why do godly people suffer? Which is a tough question, yet a common one. And it can be really hard to wrap our mind around the realities and the answer to it, but one of the things that helps us process the dynamic of suffering, what can happen in this world, and that question in and of itself is a reality that will anchor us in this conversation. And it's the next fill-in in your note, God, if you're tracking along. That God's highest priority is not to make us happy, but to make us holy. God's highest priority for you and me is not to make us happy, but to make us holy. That principle is, sits at the core of Job's life, and it sits at the core of our lives, your life and my life. That God seeks to make us holy more than he seeks to make us happy. And to be holy is to be like Jesus. Holiness is Christ-likeness. So to live and act and function like Jesus, that's the, that's the reality of holiness. And Jesus is the one that we're to follow. And God seeks to make us look more like him than to position us in some kind of temporal happiness. His highest priority is to make us holy, not to make us just simply happy. Do this for me. I want you to write down somewhere in the margin, 2 Timothy 1.9. Just write down 2 Timothy 1.9. You can get to this later this week. If you're struggling to say, is this really true? How does this actually work? Is this really God's highest priority? The answer is yes. Sit in and marinate in 2 Timothy 1.9, where it very specifically declares that from the very beginning, God's purpose was to make us holy. Lean into that and process that. Because it's anchoring to how we process the rest of the conversation. But let's get back to Job for a second. Because in Job, we find a, 
an, a, a normal, average kind of guy, but he was living a not-so-average life. And what he was experiencing and all the trials and struggles and suffering weren't about his happiness, it was about his holiness. It can, it can actually be hard to process that reality. It can be hard to listen to what he experienced, but hear me, it is still good because God always functions out of a place of goodness. And he's always seeking to position us for holiness more than happiness. Now we kind of lean into the story of Job itself, the book as a whole. It's actually a very simple story. It starts with a conversation in heaven and it leads to a description of Job's fall from wealth and prosperity to poverty. But then there's this long conversation between Job and four friends. It's actually 35 chapters of conversation between Job and his friends. The, the first of his friends is named Eliphaz. And Eliphaz is kind of a religious zealot. He would kind of be the Old Testament equivalent of a New Testament Pharisee. And his engagement conversation with Job is all around a dream that he had. The second friend in the equation is Bildad. And, and Bildad was really just offering Job trite statements, uh, old proverbs to kind of bring him along in the conversation. After Bildad, you have Zophar. And Zophar was someone who, who thought he had the corner of all religious wisdom. And so he argued with Job from a position of experience and reason. All three of them accused Job of sinning. That that was the reason this was happening. And then we get to the fourth friend, who was the youngest of the four. His name was Elihu, and he's a bit brash, but he comes the closest to declaring truth to Job. Yet his lack of humility gets in the way of it, of it actually working out and, and being healthy. And out of those conversations, 35 chapters, then God speaks, Job responds in humility, and problem solved. That's the book of Job in a nutshell. But I don't want to just focus on the book of Job today. I want to focus on the man Job to really understand how he lived a not-so-average life so that we can as well. See, when we kind of just lean into the very first part of Job, we see that he was a man who was prosperous and popular. He was a man of prayer. He was trustworthy. He was blameless. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 3, specifically describes Job this way, that he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. That, that's pretty high description. In fact, God goes on to describe him this way. God himself says this about Job in verse 8 of chapter 1. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. That's, that's a pretty good descriptor, especially coming from God. But in this dynamic, Satan enters the equation, and he actually does what he always does. He's the accuser of the brethren, and he brings an accusation. Look at verse 9. God, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. Verse 11, but now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. You know, so here's what's happening. Satan is saying to God, look, Job only follows you because you pamper him. If you change his circumstances, the whole story will change. But God says, no, no, that's not true. In fact, it's so not true. Go ahead. Go ahead. Reach out. Intersect the circumstances of his life. And Satan actually does that. He goes out and changes the circumstances of his life. The first dynamic is that all of his prosperity is taken from him. His flocks, his herds, all gone. Then his children are killed in a, in a building that collapses. This is hugely devastating. It is tragic. It had to be just this emotional, tumultuous thing for Job. Yet he responds. And how he responds is key. Because he responds with two things. Humility and worship. In all of that complexity, in all those circumstances, he responds with humility and worship. Take a look at this. Job chapter 1, starting in verse 20. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in what? Oh, come on. In what? Worship. He responds in worship and humility. And he says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Look, a not-so-average life will be positioned and postured to always respond with humility and worship first, no matter what they experience. 
A not-so-average life is positioned to respond with worship and humility. But sadly, many people respond to difficult things, respond to loss with indignation and entitlement. Like, God, how could you? Where were you? Why did you? But not Job and not-so-average Joes. They don't do that. They respond with humility and worship to the circumstances that we encounter. Think about it this way. Satan is actually posing to God saying, look, none of your kids follow you, your children follow you, except because of what they get from you. And there really isn't anybody who will follow you regardless of the circumstances that they're in. God says, go ahead, let's try this out. But it's a really good question because he's saying, is there anybody that's going to follow you regardless? And it's, it's helpful to think about that for a moment because when we're talking about circumstances, we can respond to circumstances differently. In any circumstance, we can respond because of circumstance. When we encounter something because of that circumstance, we can respond. We can also respond in spite of circumstances. So because something happens, we respond. In spite of something, we respond. This this plays out in our relationship with God and how we serve God and why we serve Him. We can serve Him because of our circumstances. So there's something good, it's the gain, it's the favor, the blessing. It could even be out of difficult circumstances that are just simply a need. We have a need here, so because of that, we respond. On the flip side, we can respond to God out of circumstances just in spite of them. That's the space of loss and sacrifice. That's the space where we say, despite that thing, or even if that thing, it's a hard space. In fact, both of these dynamics, they can, we can perceive them as positive or negative dynamics. They are just things that are and aren't. But not only responding because and in spite of, we can actually respond in a way that says, regardless of circumstances where the connection between circumstances and our lives and faith are not quite as strong. And I wonder where your faith lives today. Is is it because of circumstance? Is it in spite of circumstance? Or regardless? See, God is constantly doing two things in this world. Because he's seeking our holiness more than our happiness, he is constantly orchestrating and allowing. He orchestrates all kinds of things in life. Some of them are pleasant, enjoyable, and fun. Some of them are hard. Some of them are difficult. He's orchestrating all kinds of things. Again, because he is first seeking our holiness more than our happiness. He orchestrates a lot of things, but he never orchestrates sin and evil, but he does allow it. He allows sin and evil. He allows things that are not best. Because he's striving to position us for holiness. Now, in the reality that he orchestrates and he allows all the time, we're positioned to really look at trust. Trust. Faith is based in trust, not circumstances. It's a way to figure out where is our faith rooted and how are we responding to the circumstances. Is it because, in spite, or regardless? Which ultimately positions us to understand a next reality, which is is the fill-in in your note guide, that there is always greater purpose in everything God orchestrates or allows. Whether God is orchestrating something or allowing something, he is always seeking to work a greater purpose from it. There is reason and value to everything God orchestrates, and there is always greater purpose to come in anything that he allows. You can count on that. You may say, hang on a second, is that really true? How can I know it's true? How true is it? Well, here's the deal. Trust him and find out. Trust him no matter what happens, even if things get more difficult. And things are about to get more difficult for Job. What's what's been bad is going to turn worse. What's been awful is going to get more awful. And quite honestly, we live in a world where there is bad, where there is evil, where there are things that should never be taking place. And God doesn't say all things are good. He says he works all things for the good. And when I say this, that he has always got a greater purpose in everything that he's orchestrating or allowing, I'm not saying that there is a reason for everything that happens. That's not quite true. There are things that happen that should not happen. Evil, wrong things that are not best. And although God allows them, I'm not saying everything happens for a reason. I'm saying that all the things that do happen, God is seeking to work a greater purpose out of them for those who will trust him. 
for those who take a position of love in relationship to him. There is always greater purpose in everything God orchestrates or allows, so trust him no matter what happens, even if it gets worse. Because it does get worse for Job. His, his difficult, bad circumstances get worse. Because here's what happens. Satan ends up connecting back with God, and God's like, hey, how's my boy Job doing? And, and Satan's like, well, he's doing okay because you won't let me actually really hurt him, like, like hurt him personally, like physically. And so God says, okay, that's not true, but go ahead. Just don't kill him. And so here's what happens. Let's jump back to Scripture. Job 2 this time, chapter 2, verse 7. So then Satan went out and he afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And then, verse 8, Job took a piece of pottery and scraped himself as he sat among the ashes. Now, just as an aside, notice that Job's response from bad things turning worse is not anger. It's not running. He's not responding because or even quite in spite of circumstances. He, he's just, he actually just responds by simply tending to what is. That complexity, he's just tending to it. He's, it's a poignant moment for me in his response to a circumstance that just gets more complicated. He just responds to stewarding that space. Even though bad turned worse, he doesn't rail against God saying, God, how could you? Where are you? Why did you? He chooses to trust. Now, his wife is in a different space at this point. She's, she's had enough. If we continue on into verse 9, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. That's pretty harsh. It's a crossroad moment. And the question is, is Job going to take his eyes off his God and look at his circumstances because the board, it seems to have gone from the floor to 100 feet in the air, or is he going to trust? And what Job actually says is, how can I do what you're saying? I trust Here's what he literally says, verse 10. You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. See, what Job is doing in this moment is he is choosing trust. He's choosing to trust God regardless of circumstance. This is a choice, no matter what your circumstances are. He's saying, look, I trust you, God, regardless of what is circumstance will always challenge faith because it challenges the choice to trust. And the only thing that breaks this provision of God, whether he's orchestrating or allowing, is the choice not to trust. To say he's not good and he's not trustworthy. But if we will say, I trust regardless of what is, God's able to work and move. And what made Job a not so average Joe is that he chose to base his faith and trust, not circumstance. God trusted Job and Job trusted God, and that's what made it not so average. Now, if we lean further into the text, because Job didn't just follow God because good things were happening, or out of strong need he followed God, or even just to hold in spite of, he kind of drifted over there a little bit, but he stayed in the regardless category. If we lean further in the text, we can actually see very clearly that Job did not understand the full meaning of all of his suffering. What he knew was only that it wasn't because of sin in his life. If we have sin in our life, that's going to complicate this whole thing. But Job, even though his friends accused him of it, he knew that this was not a result of sin. And, and he had some questions, though. He, he, he had some wonderings about what was happening, and he had some questions, and you and I can have the same. And quite honestly, we don't always have the ability or have the opportunity to fully understand everything that God is trying to work out. We don't always get to understand what he's doing. And in that space, we get to trust. We don't always get the clear sense of the bigger picture that he's working, so we are positioned to trust. We don't always get an explanation for the why or the how long behind the difficulty, so we're positioned to trust. And there is always reason and value to everything that God orchestrates. And there is always greater purpose to come in everything he allows, if we'll trust. Now, in all honesty, I have walked in seasons of life where I've had questions of God and I have had to wrestle a bit with saying, is my faith rooted in trust or is it rooted in the circumstance? There's been things I just haven't understand why God allowed or orchestrated it. Even, even to this day, don't have full answers to it. Maybe you've had the same space. You've said, okay, I follow you, God. I choose to follow you, Jesus. You're my Lord. But as we lean into that, stuff starts to pop up. Maybe it's in our marriage, the challenges, the difficult circumstances. The board goes from the floor 100 feet up in the air. Everything seems to have changed. Same task. It just seems different now. And we're poised to just decide, are we going to walk by faith or, or walk by trust? Maybe it's showing up in your physical body, health issue. Maybe it's showing up in school or your workplace, your friends or your finances. And you're like, man, what am I going to do now? Am I going to trust or am I going to lean into understanding the circumstances? 
But when it comes to trusting God out of a posture of faith, circumstances should ultimately be irrelevant. They're inconsequential. When we know him and love him for who he is, regardless of what we experience, whether we think it's something good or we think it's something bad, whether he's orchestrating or allowing, when we understand who he is, we can readily trust. This actually takes us back to the Romans 8.28 passage for just a moment. Where it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. When we know and believe that he works all things, that's when we can stand in a place of trust, regardless of circumstance. Even when things aren't working out exactly the way we wanted it to go, or the way that we had hoped. Because faith is based in trust, not circumstances. Now, the tipping point for the whole book of Job is actually when God enters into this space and equation. He starts to speak. And how he does it is he actually shows up and he starts speaking by, by rattling off about 60, six zero questions. Just running down through them all. Just kind of throwing them right down on the floor. Just like, boom. And then he actually gets to a space out of that. But in all those questions, he's kind of setting up this whole thing where he's saying, look, if, if y'all actually knew who I, who I am, you wouldn't be having this conversation. And then he very specifically turns and he interacts towards Job. And he says this. This is all the way into Job 40, starting with verse 2. The, the Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. This is an awkward moment, but one that Job handles beautifully, beautifully as a not-so-average Job. Job answers the Lord, I, verse 4, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. That's a not-so-average response. That's, that's humility and worship. And my friends, many people know about God and his, his greatness and he's creator. They may even believe that he exists, but they don't actually know him. And when we don't know him, then we ask the wrong questions. We respond to circumstances the wrong way and we drift from trust because we don't know that he's good. We're not willing to trust in a space that feels like pain or loss. Yet when we choose to trust in any and every circumstance, we begin to encounter him and experience him at new levels. We actually find him. We actually can encounter him in new ways and know him. God waited for Job to get to the end of himself, get to the end of his circumstances, get to the end of asking questions to the point where he said, God, I just, I submit and surrender. I submit to you. And that's when he leaned forward and responded. Here's how Job described the whole dynamic. This is chapter 42 into verse three. Job says this, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You, he's talking to God, you said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. Verse 5, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Everything changes when we encounter him. Therefore, Job says, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. My friends, faith is based in trust, not circumstances. But here's the next layer down of that truth. The, the reality is, in your next feeling, that when we submit to God in our circumstances, we can more readily see Him. When we finally say, God, no matter what you've orchestrated, what you allowed, regardless, I submit to you, then we see Him. Then we know Him. Then we can experience Him in a new level. When we bow to Him, regardless of circumstances, He responds. The problem is many of us in our pain, all we can end up seeing is our pain and then we can't see God. The, the, the board is just so high in the air. The trip across the falls and the wheelbarrow is just too great. And we end up in a space where that's all we can see, the pain, the loss, the things that aren't, and then we can't see him. It becomes all consuming. We lose sight of him. And that is in that space when we need him most. See, when we experience pain and loss, we can actually start to accuse God or think the worst of Him. How could you allow this? Why did you do this? Why didn't you do that? And that's a space that we're not necessarily willing to trust, yet, yet He is always seeking to work good, and He actually seeks to 
to use our brokenness to lead us back to him. We saw that last week as we looked at Jonah. And until we bow, when we bow, he lifts our head. Psalm 3 tells us he is the lifter of our head. But until we bow, until we surrender, we're often not in position or surrendered enough for him to lift our head. But when we actually step into a space of surrender, when we submit to God in our circumstances, we can more readily see him because he lifts our head. That's the reward of a relationship that rises above circumstance. When we bow, we find him. We understand. We begin to have some handholds to the the journey that we're on and what he's doing. But when we bow to circumstances, we lose sight of him. Yet it was in Job's relationship with God, when it moved beyond beyond the circumstances, that the tides turned. God turned the tide. In fact, what God does is he brings back everything that Job lost. Double, twofold. Double the flocks and herds. Double the number of sheep, oxen, donkeys, and camels. Even brought back children. It's God working all things for good. Because God trusted Job and Job trusted God, that was a not-so-average life. And the re- that reality right there sits before you and I so we can ask ourselves a question. Are we trustworthy and do we trust? Because that's the dynamic of experiencing the exceptional in a not-so-average faith. To trust God and to be trustworthy. Let's just kind of shift this down into so what. In this whole journey of Job and his relationship with God, that's what enabled him to navigate what was orchestrated or allowed in the journey in a way that brought glory to God, even in great adversity. And there were four specific things that Job did that allowed him to sit in that space really well, the regardless space. And I think these four things are things you and I can do. They're not in your note guide. I encourage you to write them down in the notes section. Just four words, and I want to explain them. There's simply first pursuit, posture, prayer, and perspective. Pursuit, posture, prayer, and perspective. Yes, they're all P's, but I'm a preacher. That's just how it works. First is pursuit. Job made the first thing first. Job responded to circumstance with worship. He knew he needed to pursue God. He knew if he didn't pursue God, he would respond to circumstances out of flesh, bitterness, anger. So he made God first. He pursued worship first. Pursue God in every, regardless of circumstance. First is pursuit. Second is posture. Job not only worshiped, but he maintained humility. Maintain a posture of humility. Be willing to say, Lord, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to teach me? What do I, what do I need to step back and look at my life? What do, you wanna, what do you wanna change? Most people skip that step. Like, I just wanna get past the junk and get to the next side. And don't take the time to say, what are you trying to lead me through? You, you have a greater purpose, so what am I to learn? Is it an area of purity do I need to change? Do I need to step away from a sin issue? Take the time to have the humility and the posture of humility to respond in the right way, out of worship and humility, which then actually gets us to be able to have conversation with God in prayer. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. When we have the right posture and the right pursuit, now we can have conversation with God, interact with him, understand more. Most people will just throw questions at God, and if they get an answer they don't like, they'll start pulling up the tent stakes of their tent of commitment and move on. But Job doesn't do that. that that's a conditional relationship. Job remained committed And even though he had questions and wanted to process stuff, he leaned into God rather than leaned away, which then allowed him to have the right perspective. See, that he could rise out of the circumstances that that, that allowed God to lift his head. One of the fascinating things for me about Job is that he had perspective and rose out of his circumstances before they changed. Job Job didn't prove faithful on the backside after God doubled everything and brought everything back around and answered all of his questions. Job rose from the circumstance before the circumstance changed. And God was able to work out of that. So my friends, I encourage you to figure out which, which one of these, this week, one of these is weakest in our lives, my life, your life. Figure out which one God wants you to lean into differently, better, deeper, and take that next step into living a not-so-average life. All four things were present in Job's life. The thing about Job that fascinated me, all those crossroad moments when he had an opportunity to choose to, to be because of or in spite of moment, he chose regardless because of these four realities. And so can we. Every time he sat in a space of loss or tragedy or even peer pressure, faced with complexities of circumstance, he chose to remain in a posture of trust, in a pursuit of God. And, the, and those choices made all the difference. So what is your not-so-average opportunity this week before you? At work, in your family, in your marriage, where God's asking you to pursue Him, maintain a posture, have the right conversation and prayer, and keep the right perspective. That regardless of what is, you will trust. 
That makes all the difference. Faith is based in trust, not circumstances. And that faith starts by saying, Jesus, I follow you and have relationship with God through you. That's the place this starts. And the anchoring of all of that is about who we trust in. It's not about the what we experience. This whole not so average dynamic is about our who and not our what. And in a world with lots of complexity and lots of pain and things we wish weren't orchestrated or allowed, we can actually find peace. But our peace is found in our who, not our what. It's not in the circumstances. It's not in what we experience. It's in who we put our trust in. Whether the two by four is on the floor or in the air, whether we're going across this in a wheelbarrow ride or we're in the belly of a giant fish as we saw in Jonah. The circumstances are irrelevant. God is always seeking to work good for those who love him. Out of all things, even the bad, gross things, even the painful things, if we'll choose a posture of trust, regardless of the circumstance. Peace is found in our who, not our what. Job's four friends spent 35 chapters talking more about the what than the who. Until the who showed up. (laughs) And the, who, and the who spoke, and God spoke into that space and broke it all down. And he wants to do the same in your life. If you focus on him more than on the what. In the end of this whole journey, Job actually proves Satan's statement to be false. At least false about Job. <laughs> that, that God's people only follow him because of what they get from him. That it's because of circumstance. Job proved that we follow out of a place of love and trust, so it's regardless of circumstance. It was true for Job. The question I think we have to ask is whether it's true for us. Are we someone who who trusts by faith regardless? Or are we tempted in our pain, in the thing that's been allowed or the thing that's been orchestrated, to shift our attention from the task to the circumstance? Or are we going to remain faithful to focus on our who, not the what. When we're willing to be a people who choose trust, again, this is a choice. It doesn't matter who you are, how young or old, what you've experienced or not. Choosing to trust God regardless of circumstance is a pathway to a not so average life. But the moment we let circumstance dictate our response, we've removed trust from the one who created us. And Job was not so average because God trusted Job and Job trusted God. And you and I can live in the same space if we're willing to choose this. As you continue to reflect and process this conversation, I actually want to conclude, as we always do in prayer, but I want to pray a prayer of declaration out of Scripture. It's actually out of Romans 8, the same chapter that Paul declared God seeks to work all things for the good of those who love him. It's just a few verses later, verses 35 into verse 39, that there are some declarative statements about the love of God and who we are in proximity when we choose trust. So I want to invite everybody across the network as we step back towards worship and song to join me in prayer as I pray this scripture as a declarative prayer today. Would you pray with me? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, no circumstance will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And all God's people said, amen.